Keep Your Shape by Robert Sheckley. Only a race as incredibly elastic as the Grom could have a single rule of war. Pid the pilot slowed the ship almost to a standstill and peered anxiously at the green planet below. Even without instruments, there was no mistaking it. Third from its sun, it was the only planet in this system capable of sustaining life. Peacefully, it swam beneath its gauze of clouds. It looked very innocent, and yet twenty previous Grom expeditions had set out to prepare this planet for invasion, and vanished utterly without a word. Pid hesitated only a moment before starting irrevocably down. There was no point in hovering and worrying. He and his two crewmen were as ready now as they ever would be. Their compact displacers were stored in body pouches, inactive but ready. Pid wanted to say something to his crew, but he wasn't sure how to put it. The crew waited. Ilg, the radio man, had sent the final message to the Grom planet. Gur, the detector, read sixteen dials at once and reported, No sign of alien activity. His body surfaces flowed carelessly. Noticing the flow, Pid knew what to say to his crew. Ever since they had left Grom, shape discipline had been disgustingly lax. The invasion chief had warned him, but still, he had to do something about it. It was his duty, since lower castes such as radio men and detectors were notoriously prone to shapelessness. A lot of hopes are resting on this expedition, he began slowly. We're a long way from home now. Gur the detector nodded. Ilg, the radio man, flowed out of his prescribed shape and molded himself comfortably to a wall. However, Pitt said sternly, distance is no excuse for promiscuous shapelessness. Ilg flowed hastily back into proper radio man's shape. Exotic forms will undoubtedly be called for, Pitt went on, and for that we have special dispensation. But remember, any shape not assumed strictly in the line of duty is a foul, lawless device of the shapeless one. Gur's body surface has abruptly stopped flowing. That's all, Pitt said, and flowed into his controls. The ship started down, so smoothly coordinated that Pid felt a glow of pride. They were good workers, he decided. He just couldn't expect them to be as shape-conscious as a high-caste pilot. Even the invasion chief had told him that. Pid, the invasion chief had said in their last interview, we need this planet desperately. Yes, sir, Pid had said, standing at full attention, never quivering from optimum pilot shape. One of you, the chief said heavily, must get through and set up a displacer near an atomic power source. The army will be standing by at this end, ready to step through. We'll do it, sir, Pid said. This expedition has to succeed, the chief said and his features blurred momentarily from sheer fatigue. In strictest confidence, there is considerable unrest on Grom. The minor cast is on strike, for instance. They want a new digging shape. Say the old one is inefficient. Pid looked properly indignant. The mining shape had been set down by the ancients 50,000 years ago, together with the rest of the basic shapes. And now these upstarts wanted to change it. That's not all, the chief told him. We've uncovered a new cult of shapelessness. Picked up almost 8,000 grom, and I don't know how many more we missed. Pid knew that shapelessness was a lure of the shapeless one, the greatest evil that the grom mind could conceive of. But why, he wondered, did so many grom fall for his lures? The chief guessed his question. Pid, he said, I suppose it's difficult for you to understand. Do you enjoy piloting? Yes, sir, Pitt said simply. Enjoy piloting. It was his entire life. Without a ship, he was nothing. Not all Grom feel that way, the chief said. I don't understand it either. All of my ancestors have been invasion chiefs, back to the beginning of time. So of course I want to be an invasion chief. It's only natural as well as lawful. But the lower castes don't feel that way. The chief shook his body sadly. I've told you this for a reason. We Grom need more room. This unrest is caused purely by crowding. All our psychologists say so. Another planet to expand into will cure everything. So we're counting on you, Pid. 
Yes, sir, Pid said with a glow of pride. The chief rose to end the interview. Then he changed his mind and sat down again. You'll have to watch your crew, he said. They're loyal, no doubt, but low caste. And you know the lower castes. Pid did indeed. Gur, your detector, is suspected of harboring alterationist tendencies. He was once fined for assuming a quasi-hunter shape. Ilg has never had any definite charge brought against him, but I hear that he remains immobile for suspiciously long periods of time. Possibly he fancies himself a thinker. But sir, Pitt protested, if they are even slightly tainted with alterationism or shapelessness, why send them on this expedition? The chief hesitated before answering. There are plenty of Grom I could trust, he said slowly, but those two have certain qualities of resourcefulness and imagination that will be needed on this expedition. He sighed. I really don't understand why those qualities are usually linked with shapelessness. Yes, sir, Pid said. Just watch them. Yes, sir, Pid said again, and saluted, realizing that the interview was at an end. In his body pouch, he felt the dormant displacer ready to transform the enemy's power source into a bridge across space for the Grom hordes. Good luck, the chief said. I'm sure you'll need it. The ship dropped silently towards the surface of the enemy planet. Gurr, the detector, analyzed the clouds below and fed data into the camouflage unit. The unit went to work. Soon the ship looked, to all outward appearances, like a cirrus formation. Pid allowed the ship to drift slowly towards the surface of the mystery planet. He was in optimum pilot shape now, the most efficient of the four shapes allotted to the pilot cast. Blind, deaf, and dumb, an extension of his controls, all his attention was directed towards matching the velocities of the high-flying clouds, staying among them, becoming part of them. Gur remained rigidly in one of the two shapes allotted to detectors. He fed data into the camouflage unit, and the descending ship slowly altered into an alto-cumulus. There was no sign of activity from the enemy planet. Ilg located an atomic power source and fed the data to Pid. The pilot altered course. He had reached the lowest level of clouds, barely a mile above the surface of the planet. Now his ship looked like a fat, fleecy cumulus. And still, there was no sign of alarm. The unknown fate that had overtaken twenty previous expeditions still had not showed itself. Dusk crept across the face of the planet as Pid maneuvered near the atomic power installation. He avoided the surrounding homes and hovered over a clump of woods. Darkness fell, and the green planet's lone moon was veiled in clouds. One cloud floated lower and landed. Quick, everyone out, Pid shouted, detaching himself from the ship's controls. He assumed the pilot's shape best suited for running and raced out the hatch. Gurr and Ilg hurried after him. They stopped fifty yards from the ship and waited. Inside the ship, a little U-circuit closed. There was a silent shudder and the ship began to melt. Plastic dissolved, metal crumpled. Soon the ship was a great pile of junk, and still the process went on. Big fragments broke into smaller fragments and split and split again. Pid felt suddenly helpless, watching his ship scuttle itself. He was a pilot of the pilot cast. His father had been a pilot, and his father before him, stretching back to the hazy past when the Grom had first constructed ships. He had spent his entire childhood around ships, his entire manhood flying them. Now, shipless, he was naked in an alien world. In a few minutes, there was only a mound of dust to show where the ship had been. The night winds scattered it through the forest, and then there was nothing at all. They waited. Nothing happened. The wind sighed and the trees creaked. Squirrels chirped and birds stirred in their nests. An acorn fell to the ground. Pid heaved a sigh of relief and sat down. The 21st Grom expedition had landed safely. There was nothing to be done until morning, so Pid began to make plans. 
They had landed as close to the atomic power installation as they dared. Now they would have to get closer. Somehow, one of them had to get very near the reactor room in order to activate the displacer. Difficult, but Pid felt certain of success. After all, the Grom were strong on ingenuity. Strong on ingenuity, he thought bitterly, but terribly short of radioactives. That was another reason why this expedition was so important. There was little radioactive fuel left on any of the Grom worlds. Ages ago, the Grom had spent their store of radioactives in spreading throughout their neighboring worlds, occupying the ones that they could live on. Now, colonization barely kept up with the mounting birth rate. New worlds were constantly needed. This particular world, discovered in a scouting expedition, was needed. It suited the Grom perfectly. But it was too far away. They didn't have enough fuel to mount a conquering space fleet. Luckily, there was another way. A better way. Over the centuries, the Grom scientists had developed the Displacer, a triumph of identity engineering. The Displacer allowed mass to be moved instantaneously between any two linked points. One end was set up at Grom's sole atomic energy plant. The other end had to be placed in proximity to another atomic power source and activated. Diverted power then flowed through both ends, was modified and modified again. Then, through the miracle of identity engineering, the Grom could step through from planet to planet, or pour through in a great overwhelming wave. It was quite simple. But twenty expeditions had failed to set up the Earth End Displacer. What had happened to them was not known, for no Grom ship had ever returned to tell. Before dawn, they crept through the woods, taking on the coloration of the plants around them. Their displacers pulsed feebly, sensing the nearness of atomic energy. A tiny four-legged creature darted in front of them. Instantly, Gur grew four legs in a long, streamlined body and gave chase. Gur, come back here, Pid howled to the detector, throwing caution to the winds. Gur overtook the animal and knocked it down. He tried to bite it, but he had neglected to grow teeth. The animal jumped free and vanished into the underbrush. Gurr thrust out a set of teeth and bunched his muscles for another leap. Gurr! Reluctantly, the detector turned away. He loped silently back to Pid. I was hungry, he said. You were not, Pid said sternly. Was, Gurr mumbled, writhing with embarrassment. Pid remembered what the chief had told him. Gurr certainly did have hunter tendencies. He would have to watch him more closely. We'll have no more of that, Pitt said. Remember, the lure of exotic shapes is not sanctioned. Be content with the shape you were born to. Gurr nodded and melted back into the underbrush. They moved on. At the extreme edge of the woods, they could observe the atomic energy installation. Pid disguised himself as a clump of shrubbery, and Gurr formed himself into an old log. Ill, after a moment's thought, became a young oak. The installation was in the form of a long, low building, surrounded by a metal fence. There was a gate and guards in front of it. The first job, Pid thought, was to get past that gate. He began to consider ways and means. From the fragmentary reports of the survey parties, Pid knew that, in some ways, this race of men were like the Grom. They had pets, as the Grom did, and homes and children and a culture. The inhabitants were skilled mechanically, as were the Grom, but there were terrific differences also. The men were of fixed and immutable form, like stones or trees, and to compensate, their planet boasted a fantastic array of species, types, and kinds. This was completely unlike Grom, which had only eight distinct forms of animal life. And evidently, the men were skilled at detecting invaders, Pid thought. He wished he knew how the other expeditions had failed. It would make his job much easier. A man lurched past them on two incredibly stiff legs. Rigidity was evident in his every move. Without looking, he hurried past. I know, Gar said after the creature had moved away. I'll disguise myself as a man, walk through the gate of the reactor room, and activate my displacer. You can't speak their language, Pid pointed out. I won't speak at all. I'll ignore them. Look, Gurr quickly shaped himself into a man. That's not bad, Pitt said. 
Gurr tried a few practice steps, copying the bumpy walk of the man. But I'm afraid it won't work, Pitt said. It's perfectly logical, Gurr pointed out. I know, therefore the other expeditions must have tried it, and none of them came back. There was no arguing that. Gurr flowed back into the shape of a log. What then, he asked. Let me think, Pitt said. Another creature lurched past, on four legs instead of two. Pid recognized it as a dog, a pet of man. He watched it carefully. The dog ambled to the gate, head down, in no particular hurry. It walked through, unchallenged, and lay down in the grass. Hmm, Pid said. They watched. One of the men walked past and touched the dog on the head. The dog stuck out its tongue and rolled over on its side. I can do that, Gurr said excitedly. He started to flow into the shape of a dog. No, wait, Pid said. We'll spend the rest of the day thinking it over. This is too important to rush into. Gurr subsided sulkily. Come on, let's move back, Pid said. He and Gurr started into the woods. Then he remembered Ilg. Ilg? he called softly. There was no answer. Ilg! What? Oh, yes an oak tree said, and melted into a bush. Sorry, what were you saying? We're moving back, Pitt said. Were you by any chance thinking? Uh, no, Ilg assured him, just resting. Pitt let it go at that. There was too much else to worry about. They discussed it for the rest of the day, hidden in the deepest part of the woods. The only alternatives seemed to be man or dog. A tree couldn't walk past the gate, since it was not in the nature of trees— nor could anything else and escape notice. Going as a man seemed too risky. They decided that Gurr would sally out in the morning as a dog. Now get some sleep, Pid said. Obediently, his two crewmen flattened out, going immediately shapeless. But Pid had a more difficult time. Everything looked too easy. Why wasn't the atomic installation better guarded? Certainly the men must have learned something from the expeditions they had captured in the past. Or had they killed them without asking any questions? You couldn't tell what an alien would do. Was that open gate a trap? Wearily, he flowed into a comfortable position on the lumpy ground. Then he pulled himself together hastily. He had gone shapeless. Comfort was not in the line of duty, he reminded himself, and firmly took a pilot shape. But a pilot shape wasn't constructed for sleeping on damp, bumpy ground. Pid spent a restless night thinking of ships and wishing he were flying one. He awoke in the morning tired and ill-tempered. He nudged Gurr. Let's get this over with, he said. Gurr flowed gaily to his feet. Come on, Ilg, Pid said angrily, looking around. Wake up. There was no reply. Ilg, he called. Still, there was no reply. Help me look for him, Pid said to Gurr. He must be around here somewhere. Together they tested every bush, tree, log, and shrub in the vicinity, but none of them was ilk. Pid began to feel a cold panic run through him. What could have happened to the radio man? Perhaps he decided to go through the gate on his own, Gurr suggested. Pid considered the possibility. It seemed unlikely. Ilk had never shown much initiative. He had always been content to follow orders. They waited. But midday came and there was still no sign of ilk. We can't wait any longer, Pid said, and they started through the woods. Pid wondered if Ilg had tried to get through the gates on his own. Those quiet types often concealed a foolhardy streak. But there was nothing to show that Ilg had been successful. He would have to assume that the radio man was dead or captured by the men. That left two of them to activate a displacer. And he still didn't know what had happened to the other expeditions. At the edge of the woods, Gurr turned himself into a facsimile of a dog. Pitt inspected him carefully. A little less tail, he said. Gurr shortened his tail. More ears. Gurr lengthened his ears. Now even them up. They became even. Pitt inspected the finished product. As far as he could tell, Gurr was perfect from the tip of his tail to his wet black nose. Good luck, Pitt said. Thanks. Cautiously, Gurr moved out of the woods, walking in the lurching style of dogs and men. At the gate, the guard called to him. 
Hid held his breath. Gur walked past the man, ignoring him. The man started to walk over. Gur broke into a run. Pid shaped a pair of strong legs for himself, ready to dash if Gur was caught. But the guard turned back to his gate. Gur stopped running immediately and strolled quietly towards the main door of the building. Pid dissolved his legs with a sigh of relief, and then tensed again. The main door was closed. Pid hoped the radio men wouldn't try to open it. That was not in the nature of dogs. As he watched, another dog came running toward Gur. Gur backed away from him. The dog approached and sniffed. Gur sniffed back. Then both of them ran around the building. That was clever, Pid thought. There was bound to be a door in the rear. He glanced up at the afternoon sun. As soon as the displacer was activated, the Grom armies would begin to pour through. By the time the men recovered from the shock, a million or more Grom troops would be here, weapons and all, with more following. The day passed slowly, and nothing happened. Nervously, Pid watched the front of the plant. It shouldn't be taking so long if Gur was successful. Late into the night, he waited. Men walked in and out of the installation, and dogs barked around the gates, but Gur did not appear. Gur had failed. Ilg was gone. Only he was left, and still he didn't know what had happened. By morning, Pid was in complete despair. He knew that the 21st Grom expedition to this planet was near the point of complete failure. Now it was all up to him. He saw that workers were arriving in great number, rushing through the gates. He decided to take advantage of the apparent confusion and started to shape himself into a man. A dog walked past the woods where he was hiding. Hello, the dog said. It was Gur. What happened? Pitt asked with a sigh of relief. Why were you so long? Couldn't you get in? I don't know, Gur said, wagging his tail. I didn't try. Pid was speechless. I went hunting, Gur said complacently. This form is ideal for hunting, you know. I went out the rear gate with another dog. But the expedition, your duty, I changed my mind, Gur told him. You know, pilot, I never wanted to be a detector. But you were born a detector. That's true, Gur said, but it doesn't help. I always wanted to be a hunter. Pid shook his entire body in annoyance. You can't, he said very slowly, as one would explain to a gromling. The hunter shape is forbidden to you. Not here it isn't, Gur said, still wagging his tail. Let's have no more of this, Pid said angrily. Get into that installation and set up your displacer. I'll try to overlook this heresy. No, Gur said. I don't want the Grom here. They'd ruin it for the rest of us. He's right, a nearby oak tree said. Ilg, Pid gasped. Where are you? Branches stirred. I'm right here, Ilg said. I've been thinking... But your cast. Pilot, Gur said sadly, why don't you wake up? Most of the people on Grom are miserable. Only custom makes us take the cast shape of our ancestors. Pilot, Ilg said, all Grom are born shapeless. And being born shapeless, all Grom should have the freedom of shape, Gur said. Exactly, Ilg said. But he'll never understand. Now excuse me, I want to think and the oak tree was silent. Pid laughed humorously. The men will kill you off, he said, just as they killed off all the other expeditions. No one from Grom has been killed, Gur told him. The other expeditions are right here. Alive? Certainly. The men don't even know we exist. That dog I was hunting with is a Grom from the Twelfth Expedition. There are hundreds of us here, pilot. We like it. Pid tried to absorb it all. He'd always known that the lower castes were lax in caste consciousness, but this was preposterous. This planet's secret menace was freedom. Join us, pilot, Gur said. We've got a paradise here. Do you know how many species there are on this planet? An uncountable number. There's a shape to suit every need. Pid ignored them. Traitors. He'd do the job all by himself. 
So men were unaware of the presence of Grom. Getting near the reactor might not be so difficult after all. The others had failed in their duty because they were of lower castes, weak and irresponsible. Even the pilots among them must be secretly sympathetic to the cult of shapelessness the chief had mentioned, or the alien planet could never have swayed them. What shape to assume for this attempt? Pid considered. A dog might be best. Evidently, dogs could wander pretty much where they wished. If something went wrong, Pid could change his shape to meet the occasion. The Supreme Council will take care of all of you, he snarled, and shaped himself into a small brown dog. I'm going to set up the displacer myself. He studied himself for a moment, bared his teeth at Gurr, and loped towards the gate. He loped for about ten feet and stopped in utter horror. The smells rushed at him from all directions, smells in a profusion and variety he had never dreamed existed. Smells that were harsh, sweet, sharp, heavy, mysterious, overpowering. Smells that terrified, alien and repulsive and inescapable. The odors of earth struck him like a blow. He curled his lips and held his breath. He ran on for a few steps and had to breathe again. He almost choked. He tried to remold his dog nostrils to be less sensitive. It didn't work. It wouldn't, so long as he kept the dog's shape. An attempt to modify his metabolism didn't work either. All this in the space of two or three seconds. He was rooted in his tracks, fighting the smells, wondering what to do. Then the noises hit him. They were a constant and staggering roar through which every tiniest whisper of sound stood out clearly and distinct. Sounds upon sounds, more noise than he had ever heard before at one time in his life. The woods behind him had suddenly become a madhouse. Utterly confused, he lost control and became shapeless. He half ran, half flowed into a nearby bush. There he reshaped, obliterating the offending dog ears and nostrils with vicious strokes of his thoughts. The dog shape was out, absolutely. Such appalling sharpness of senses might be fine for a hunter such as Gurr. He probably gloried in them. But another moment of such impressions would have driven Pid the pilot mad. What now? He lay in the bush and thought about it, while gradually his mind threw off the last effects of the dizzying sensory assault. He looked at the gate. The men standing there evidently hadn't noticed his fiasco. They were looking in another direction. A man? Well, it was worth a try. Studying the men at the gate, he had carefully shaped himself into a facsimile, a synthesis, actually, embodying one characteristic of that, another of this. He emerged from the side of the bush opposite the gate, on his hands and knees. He sniffed the air noting that the smells the man nostrils picked up weren't unpleasant at all. In fact, some of them were decidedly otherwise. It had just been the acuity of the dog nostrils, the number of smells they had detected, and the near brilliance with which they had done so, that had shocked him. Also, the sounds weren't half so devastating. Only relatively close sounds stood out. All else was an undetailed whispering. Evidently, Pid thought, it had been a long time since men had been hunters. He tested his legs, standing up and taking a few clumsy steps. Thud of foot on ground, dragged the other leg forward in a heavy arc, thud. Rocking from side to side, he marched back and forth behind the bush. His arms flapped as he sought balance, his head wobbled on its neck until he remembered to hold it up. Head up, eyes down, he missed... Seeing a small rock, his heel turned on it. He sat down hard. The ankle hurt. Pid curled his man lips and crawled back into the bush. The man's shape was too unspeakably clumsy. It was offensive to plod one step at a time, body held rigidly upright, arms wobbling. There had been a deluge of sense impressions in the dog shape. There was a dull, stiff, half-alive inadequacy to the man shape. 
Besides, it was dangerous now that Pid thought it over, as well as distasteful. He couldn't control it properly. It wouldn't look right. Someone might question him. There was too much about men he didn't, couldn't know. The planting of the displacer was too important a thing for him to fumble again. Only luck had kept him from being seen during the sensory onslaught. The displacer in his body pouch pulsed and tugged, urging him to be on his way towards the distant reactor room. Grimly, Pitt let out the last breath he had taken with his man lungs and dissolved the lungs. What shape to take? Again, he studied the gate, the men standing beside it, the building beyond in which was the all-important reactor. A small shape was needed, a fast one, an unobtrusive one. He lay and thought. The bush rustled above him. A small brown shape had fluttered down to light on a twig. It hopped to another twig, twittering. Then it fluttered off in a flash and was gone. That, Pitt thought, was it. A sparrow that was not a sparrow rose from the bush a few moments later. An observer would have seen it circle the bush, diving, hedge-hopping, even looping, as if practicing all maneuvers possible to sparrows. Pid tensed his shoulder muscles, inclined his wings. He slipped off to the right, approached the bush at what seemed breakneck speed, though he knew this was only because of his small size. At the last second, he lifted his tail, not quite quickly enough. He swooped up and over the top of the bush, but his legs brushed the top leaves. His beak went down, and he stumbled in the air for a few feet, back, forward. He blinked beady eyes, as if at a challenge, back towards the bush at a fine clip again, up and over, this time cleanly. He chose a tree, zoomed into its network of branches, wove a web of flight, working his way around and around the trunk, over and under branches that flashed before him, through crotches with no more than a feather's breath to spare. At last, he rested on a low branch and found himself chirping in delight. The tree extruded a feeler from the branch he sat on and touched his wings and tail. Interesting, said the tree. I'll have to try that shape sometime. Ilg, traitor, hissed Pid, growing a mouth in his chest to hiss it. And then he did something that caused Ilg to exclaim in outrage. Pid flew out of the woods, over the underbrush and across the open space towards the gate. This body would do the trick. This body would do anything. He rose, in a matter of a few sparrow heartbeats, to an altitude of a hundred feet. From here, the gate, the men, the building were small, sharp shapes against a green-brown mat. Pid found that he could see not only with unaccustomed clarity, but with a range of vision that astonished him. To right and to left, he could see far into the hazy blue of the sky, and the higher he rose, the further he could see. He rose higher, the displacer pulsed, reminding him of the job he had to do. He stiffened his wings and glided regretfully, putting aside his desires to experiment with this wonderful shape, at least for the present. After he planted the displacer, he would go off by himself for a while and do it just a little more, somewhere where Ilg and Gur would not see him, before the Grom army arrived and the invasion began. He felt a tiny twinge of guilt as he circled. It was evil to want to keep this alien flying shape any longer than was absolutely necessary to the performance of his duty. It was a device of the shapeless one. But what had Ilg said? All Grom are born shapeless. It was true. Grom children were amorphous until old enough to be instructed in the cast shape of their ancestors. Maybe it wasn't too great a sin to alter your shape, then. Just once in a long while. After all, one must be fully aware of the nature of evil in order to meaningfully reject it. He had fallen lower in circling. The displacer pulse had strengthened. For some reason it irritated him. He drove higher on strong wings, circled again. Air rushed past him, a smooth, whispering flow pierced by his beak, streaming invisibly past his sharp eyes, moving along his body in tiny turbulences that moved his feathers against his skin. It occurred to him, or rather struck him with considerable force. 
that he was satisfying a longing of his pilot cast that went far deeper than piloting. He drove powerfully with his wings, felt tonus across his back, shot forward and up. He thought of the controls of his ship. He imagined flowing into them, becoming part of them as he had so often done. And for the first time in his life, the thought failed to excite him. No machine could compare with this. What he would give to have wings of his own. Get from my sight, shapeless one. The displacer must be planted, activated. All Grom depended on him. He eyed the building far below. He would pass over it. The displacer would tell him which window to enter. Which window was so near the reactor that he could do his job before the men even knew he was about. He started to drop lower. And the hawk struck. It had been above him. His first inkling of danger was the sharp pain of talons in his back and the stunning blow of a beak across his head. Dazed, he let his back go shapeless. His body substance flowed from the grasp of the talons. He dropped a dozen feet and resumed sparrow shape, hearing an astonished squawk from the attacker. He banked and looked up. The hawk was eyeing him. Talons spread again. The sharp beak gaped. The hawk swooped. Pid had to fight as a bird, naturally. He was 400 feet above the ground. So he became an impossibly deadly bird. He grew to twice the size of the hawk. He grew a foot-long beak with a double razor's edge. He grew talons like six-inch scimitars. His eyes gleamed a red challenge. The hawk broke flight, squalling in alarm. Frantically, tail down and widespread, it thundered its wings and came to a dead stop six feet from Pid. Looking thoughtfully at Pid, it allowed itself to plummet. It fell a hundred feet, spread its wings, stretched its neck, and flew off so hastily that its wings became blurs. Pid saw no reason to pursue it. Then, after a moment, he did. He glided, keeping the hawk in sight, thoughts racing, feeling the newness, the power, the wonder of freedom of shape. Freedom. He did not want to give it up. The bird shape was wondrous. He would experiment with it. Later he might tire of it for a time and assume another, a crawling or running shape or even a swimming one. The possibilities for excitement, for adventure, for fulfillment and simple sensual pleasures were endless. Freedom of shape was, obviously, now that you thought on it, the Grom birthright. And the caste system was artificial, obviously, a device for political and priestly benefit. Obviously. Go away, shapeless one. This does not concern you. He rose to a thousand feet. Two thousand. Three. The displacer's pulse grew feebler and finally vanished. At four thousand feet, he released it and watched it spin downward, vanish into a cloud. Then he set out after the hawk, which was now only a dot on the horizon. He would find out how the hawk had broken flight as it had. Skidded on the air. He wanted to do that too. There were so many things he wanted to learn about flying. In a week, he thought, he should be able to duplicate all the skill that millennia had evolved into birds. Then his new life would really begin. He became a torpedo shape with huge wings and sped after the hawk. End of Keep Your Shape by Robert Sheckley